Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Let's Talk. We're talking about our policing. Policing in the context of the communities in Tower Hamlets. That's the most important context. But, of course, we'll be talking about policing, we'll be talking about the budget and its implications, we'll be talking about all sorts of other issues to do with crime, employabilities, opportunities for the BMU community within the police, of course, and most importantly, community engagement. The question I'm asking, and you should be asking, do we find our police officers and our police force engaging with the community sufficiently and in a manner that is sensitive and conducive to the needs of the local people? And do we see our policing adversarial or do we see it as friendly? Do you trust your local police officers? Do you have a relationship with them? Do you know who is the boss in your local borough in terms of police boss? And more importantly, do you feel safe? Safe in the sense that the police officers were responsible for keeping you, me and our streets, our children, our families, our neighbours and the entire area safe. Do we feel safe in their presence? All these questions are mine and of course you have yours. We're doing something quite different today. We're going live on our Facebook, that is Channel S's Facebook. So go on Facebook Live, watch us on that and you can raise questions and comments. And those questions and comments that are raised throughout our program, the ones that are appropriate, I will either read them out or I will, I will raise those questions on your behalf. We're not taking any phone calls. We do, however, we are taking emails. You can email us directly. So let's start by introducing our guest. Our guest tonight is Chief Superintendent Sue Williams. She is none other than the boss of the police force in Tower Hamlets. Sue Williams, welcome to our program. So thank you very much for inviting me here. How are you feeling? Yeah, good. Good, thank you very You're looking much. relaxed. Uh, I'll try to be. <laughs> Though in your uniform. Yeah, no, I thought I'd come smart today. So normally we wear our body worn cam, um, sorry, our body vest with the body worn camera and our radios, but I didn't want it to interfere with what I wanted because this is serious I stuff. I think you should have come with those. You could have done the recordings and got your walkie talkies to talk in between yeah well, that would have been fun so it would have been good to show because we've just gone live with body worn camera um and that is really good it's good for the community it's good for the police so it safeguards all of us it it will the officers can record interactions with um, people that they stop and search or they can record interactions with victims or when they come across someone with a public order event um, and more importantly, when we go into things like domestic um, abuse or, or domestic incidents, we will always record those because if the victim doesn't want to go take it to court, um, we've got it on camera. And why we can why use is that. it that only in domestic environments that is, uh, they must record? Why should you not record all the time for any actions mm -hmm. taken against any civilians? Should you not record that too? Yes, yeah, so it does record. It records on a loop. Um, the officer has to hit the button for it to continuously record. So it records every 30 seconds, and then if they come across a stop in the search, an incident in the street, the officers use it for everything, but they're mandated to certain things like domestic, stop and search. They must record. My officers love it, and they will record everything because it protects them. So we'd have less complaints made about the police because it's all on camera. It also captures people that are doing things wrong. And it also, um, it also makes, um, it's a better conversation when you're talking to a couple of people that you might suspect of crime and you can record directly what they're saying about what they've said has happened. So you can get their point of view on camera as well. With, with, the, so, with the advent of social media now, people are also recording things on their phone. Ah. And they're also broadcasting mm. them quite fast and furiously across the network. Yeah. So obviously you recording the same event is very important to corroborate exactly what happened and you're absolutely right and the advent of social media people do record but what happens is it becomes selective recording sure. so when they go to put it on youtube facebook whatever their choice is they edit it to the bit that they think is the most powerful bit 
that will show either the police in a bad light or it might show the suspects doing something or not doing something. D so just, it's more just, selective. Just pause Whereas, with that thought, mm. selective recording against, of course, universal recording as you talk about. We're going to take a quick break, as you know why, but we will be back very soon and we'll continue our conversation with uh, Chief Superintendent Sue Williams. Don't go too far away. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. We're talking about policing in town hamlets. We're talking about not crime, definitely. We're talking about employment and employability for the BMU communities. We're talking about community engagement. I want to, I want to kick start with uh, something that's very close to my heart. But before I do that, we were talking about police gadgets and how mm. police operate on the street so that you know the tools that they use. I know... Um, Sue, am I okay to call yeah, you, you Sue? Yeah, you can call yeah. me Sue, Sue Absolutely. has got uh, the yeah. camera that she was talking about earlier on. Um, uh, go on, Sue. Tell us what's, what, what are those gadgets on your hand? Okay, so all the officers get this little aid memoir and it tells them what they should and shouldn't use it for. Um, it is up to an officer what they want to record, but they must record if they're arresting someone, if they're stopping and searching a critical incident, if they're stopping a motor vehicle. So there's certain things in here as a, an aid memoir. So this is it. It records every 30 seconds, just put it on. If something happens, so it, it makes a noise, but if something happens, I double click. Should double click. <laughs> ah. You probably have double click simultaneously. Oh yeah, let's try that. Yeah, quite. You can, tell, you can tell how often I use them. Uh -huh. So, um, okay, thank you very much for that. So now it's recording. Uh, I can so see the red thing any, there. any interactions my officers will have with the community, um, they, will, they will record like that. If there's something significant, i.e. somebody makes an admission or there's somebody with a bruise that they want to capture, they'll click it just to flag that moment because when we finished at the end of the tour of duty, it downloads straight away so the officers can pick it up and put it in their crime evidence papers that will go to court. How long does it record for or how's the capacity for its recording? Um, over 24 hours, I oh. think the battery lasts. Oh, what about so, the memory, memory itself? Has it got enough memory to be yeah, able to store yeah, so, the officers, so much data? The officers work about somewhere between eight and ten hour shifts um, and then when they're on aid in central London, it will last um, for the entire quite duration. a long period. Okay, very yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. So, when I finish recording, just hold it down, three seconds. Yeah, that's switched off. I can see And it that. goes off. Mm -hmm. And that's it. But the good thing is, if the officer's done something wrong, right, we can play this back and we can watch it. If the officer has done something wrong, then be assured I will take action against that individual. But if they haven't, I'm able to show it to the complainants or we're able to counteract any allegations that are made on social media or in the press um, because we have it recorded. So it helps both sides. It helps the community know that we, we are recording things, that we are capturing things um, that are correct. Um, and if somebody's done something wrong, and the officers often work in pairs or there are other units that will come to the scene. So it's not just their camera. It will be everybody's camera will be capturing an incident. Amazing. So we can look at it all the way Very through. Very good. So if the police officers are doing something wrong, they can be challenged because on most occasions these would be recording and yeah. recording almost live as to what's going on. Unless they obviously go out of their way to record a particular incident. Otherwise it records on a loop. That, that's right. Okay. But as I said, there are other officers. So if one officer hasn't put press the, press the record, there will be other officers that will be doing that. It may be a good idea to make it mandatory to record all their activities. And at the end of the day, if there is nothing significant to notice, wipe them off. Yeah. But that's another discussion. Okay, Absolutely. let me ask you by us, uh, uh, let me b begin my program by looking at some of the feedbacks I'm getting on our Facebook Live. Okay. And of the questions that we are getting as a result of the emails. Let me throw in the first, qu uh, the first question which is, what is the relationship between police and young people in Tower Hamlets? A lot of young people in Tower Hamlets, of course, yeah. are very frustrated. Yeah. If not, they're very suspicious of police officers. And I've seen it with my own eyes when small incidents are blown out of all proportions and a lot of young people gather, small incident turns into a big massive, uh, um, I don't know, riot and, and a situation and things get out of hand. So tell me the relationship that you have between 
police officers and young people, if there is any. OK, so to be honest, it's mixed. So we have some good relationships with schools. I have schools officers in, in the secondary schools. I have schools officers that work with our pupil referral units, with the college, university, with young people there. Um, we also have some really good youth projects that we're involved with, Met Kicks, Met Tracks, which is about athletics and football programmes, and they're seen as diversion activities for young people to get involved with. Um, but clearly, I want to engage with young people because I want to know how they want me to police the borough. Um, but it has been difficult, and when I put on um, a youth engagement um, activity, um, or, or a conference. Um, I did it at the East London Mosque because I wanted to get as many kids in there as possible. Um, it was advertised, no young people turned up. So it's difficult. But if why I'm... would you expect young people to turn up to a uh, mosque? Wouldn't they not be more interested if you did a policing consultation or a policing and community youth engagement in a place where they would hang out? They would hang out in the youth yeah. club if there was one left open uh, by our recent administration, cuts and cuts and cuts, but we'll come to that in a minute. But you're right, you're absolutely right. You can't just do it in one place. So we've, we've been to the Spotlight Centre, which is um, in the west of the borough, uh, and we've held events there. We have had several young people question and answer um, events where, which has been put on by our Safer Neighbourhood Board. And we've had really good crowds there. We've had about 100 kids turn up, and they will tell it as it is. So one thing that I picked out of that was they, they would like a youth advisory group established on the borough. So we're working with the local authority um, because Waltham Forest here have a fantastic youth advisory group and they work with the police and they, they do projects with the police around things like knife crime, gang activity, and they put the, how the young people feel and the impact of policing to the police officers so that we understand and they get involved in their training. Now I want to do that on Tower Hamlets. So we're trying to establish a youth IAG which will help us. But there's What's loads youth IAG? Youth um, Independent Advisory Group. You're composed of youth? Young people, absolutely. And they would advise the police officers? Absolutely. And if a young person who is watching our programme was interested in getting involved and becoming yep. part of the advisory board, what should they, what should they do? So we're going to start recruiting fairly soon. Okay. Um, we've just had some agreements with the local authority who are going to manage the project for us um, because there, there clearly has to be somewhere they meet and we have to uh, work with the young people to make sure that they're working on projects that are... Um, valuable to Tower Hamlets. So things like we want to get into young people about not carrying knives when they're out and about. So it's better for young people to talk to young people peer on peer about why it's not right to carry a knife. Because I can tell young people don't carry a knife and they're not going to listen to me. But they will listen to another young person. So we've got some really good projects that we want to initiate and we're about to start recruiting young people towards that. But if anyone's interested, then please contact me or one of their safer neighbourhood um, on their local ward and um, or the schools team even, um, if they're at school or university and we'll put their details forward. But it's not going to be a whitewash as we see in various government or statutory body advisory groups where um, you say you're going to be consulting. You say you're going to be bringing people of different background. What we then see is political parties using their leverage as well as influence take over and it becomes a political machinery, an ex arm extended by a local party or the usual suspects sit around the table and have a chat. The real young people are actually left out. Are you going to be able to guarantee me and my viewers that you're not going to Firstly, allow the cronies to take over. Mm. Secondly, for it to become a political uh, extension of a party. And thirdly, from the usual suspects from dominating. So that's what I'm going to try and attempt to make sure that doesn't happen. So we've taken our advice from Waltham Forest, who have got a very good youth advisory group. They have done some absolutely fantastic work um, creating um, projects around videos, YouTube, they've been into schools, they've worked with young people and we want to copy their model which is really good and bring it to Tower Hamlets. But you're absolutely right, I don't want people that are going to come along and turn it into a political football for somebody else's use. It's got to be young people that are passionate about what what they want to achieve in Tower Hamlets and how they think that they can help us um, communicate and, 
um, engage young people, particularly around crime types that are so so endearing to them that they, you know, things like knife crime, where they're absolutely passionate as well. I mean, talking they, about knife crime, there has been a huge increase in gun crime, knife crime in the borough. There has been an 8% increase. And I know you did say you may not be able to quote stats. That's okay. You're not yeah. expected to. And this is not a national figure. There's a figure related to Tower Hamlets. 611 cases of knife crime. We have also got 614 crimes, including um, 268 rapes. These are all staggering figures. Mm. Of course, gun crime has been on the increase 16%, 102 cases. And we have we heard and we have witnessed on our TV screens, on our newspaper headlines, the appalling uh, condition of people who have been a victim of uh, acid attack. And a lot of them have taken place in Tahamlis, not one or two, a few. Um, how do you reconcile that with your effort to firstly bring young people on the board of advisors mm -hmm. as well as actually tackling the crime? OK, so you've asked several things yes. there. Mm -hmm. So gun crime so my figures show me for tower hamlets gun crime has significantly decreased so i'm not quite sure where you get your increase but um the figures i look at significantly decreased gun crime gun crime but knife crime, crime has increased knife sig crime significantly has increased throughout the met yes but what i look at which is really important is knife crime amongst gang members because we have like every borough we have a cohort of gangs and they're particularly young people we have reduced knife crime amongst those gangs by eight percent where the rest of the met their gang cohorts have increased knife crime so we've been doing a lot of work but in our borough in this borough in Tower hamlets itself we have had people who have been knifed oh yes uh, like Jamin or, or the other day i remember i went to his funeral i went to his yeah. burial um i was um, doing something in the local area when there was a knife crime in um, uh, Valence Road um, uh, under a particular block of flat. Somebody was killed. On one day, I witnessed one knife crime, one acid attack, and a brawl between a bunch of young people and the mm. police officers within one square mile of where I was, in Tamlets. Yeah. So there is something obviously not working. Okay, so let me tell you about an initiative that we've been doing. Okay. So we've been doing what we call flash searches. So this is mobilizing the community to come out with the police and search open spaces for knives and weapons. And we've been very successful. We've had community people come out, we've had faith people, we've had local councillors. They've all come out, got their hands dirty, and they've dug into the areas around the open spaces and recovered a number of knives. Now, so much so that this initiative has been picked up nationally. We've had people come to talk to us about what we're doing. Even the commissioner talked about she would like this done in every borough because People don't like carrying knives, but they'll stash them and they'll go back for them. But those and knives... that's what we're trying to find. And we want the community to help us. We can't do it all ourselves. But why don't you, as police officers, as Tower Hamlet's uh, chief of police, why don't you call for an amnesty, for a, say for a week or two, and have a bank? Where we've got people... it. You have we've got, got it? it? We've got it in Bethnal Green Police Station. There's a knife bin there. Okay. So people can put it in there. Amnesties are really tricky. So what, these people will not be prosecuted if they put their knife there? If they put their knife in there, absolutely. Just stick a knife in the bin. But if somebody... But the police officers but, are not going to pick him on. up. Right. Sorry? A police officer is not going to pick that person up for so, carrying a knife so, and dropping it to the police right. station. So if there's somebody like somebody that is known to carry knives or they're a robber who uses a knife and they say, oh, I'm just going to put it in the knife bin, we may question their motives. But if it's genuinely a parent that says, I found this knife in my kid's bag, I don't want it, and they stick it in the bin, but, but that doesn't, we're not going to get... That, but that doesn't work. Prosecute you them. can't expect people to deposit their knives if there is any potential for arrest and prosecution. You won't get much of a result. That does not sound right to me. That sounds illogical. If they you do, want, if they you, do deposit them, but you are there is a potential for prosecution. So it's all on individual circumstances. So this is what I've said. If somebody like a parent, responsible adult, comes into the police station and deposits the knife, we're not going to arrest them. If they tell us that they found the knife and or they've rung us up, we might even go and collect it. But if you've got 
somebody that is known to us as a criminal or has been involved in crime and they've known to carry a knife and then they say, oh, I was just bringing it to the police station, we may not believe them. No, but if they have come to the police station with a knife and they've just dropped it in the machine... In oh, the well, system. no, if they're dropping it in the machine... Uh, it's not a machine, it's a box. Yeah. If they drop it in there... That's what we want. But if you've picked up somebody on no. the street, that's a different discussion. Absolutely. So I'm talking about anyone. No, if who they wants bring it to. to the police station. So what if they call you and say, "Look, I'm X, Y, and Z. I'm about to bring a knife to the police station. Uh, would you help that person?" Yeah, absolutely. If somebody wants to get rid of knives, we want to take them off the street. Okay. We don't want them there. So, you know, we need to work together as a community. And one of the things I say to parents is, you need to know what your kids are carrying. Because young people do carry knives. And they're not the sort of Bowie knives you get off the no, internet. No, of course. They're lethal they're, knives. They're kitchen knives. So if you see a kitchen knife missing, you need to challenge your kid around what have you got but in you your bag. But you can pick up a kitchen knife from Sainsbury's. The other well, day, I picked up a kitchen knife for three pounds from Sainsbury's. Believe it or not, it's the sharpest knife I've ever seen. You're right. It cuts through anything. Yeah. And if supermarkets can sell them, nobody asked me for my ID. Nobody asked me what am I going to do with it. I just bought it. It was a shopping trip I went. I had to buy a knife. I bought a knife. So how would you feel if you were challenged then? Excuse me, sir, why are you buying a knife? I'd be happy somebody if somebody would challenged. You? Yes. Well, then maybe that's a conversation we should have with the stores. So with young people, we have spoken because to... Because I believe... Sorry to cut, to cut you, Sue. I believe every knife bought by a person, because it's a potential weapon, mm. should be registered. I should be asked to produce in the store my driving license and register a knife in my name. You ask your community yes. or you ask your viewers, do they agree with you? Well, I'm asking because, this. Do you because agree that's with this? An interesting yeah, let's ask this thing. question. Do you think, and you can go on Facebook Live right yeah. now and tell me if you do, do you think to reduce and take these knives away from our streets, every outlet that sells knives, whether they're on the internet, whether they're all at the supermarket, must have a means by which it can be vetted that this is being bought by an adult and that adult must be traceable. So if I buy a knife online and I commit a crime and that knife is found and therefore I can be traced back as the owner of the knife, I should be held accountable as to where I kept the knife, whomever had the access to. I believe this would reduce our crime rate substantially, especially knife a, a, a crime. What do you think? If you agree with this, would you mind if you're being challenged at the supermarket to produce your ID? Would you mind registering your knife? I don't. What do you think? Give us a call. In fact, you can call us. Email us. You can go on Facebook Live right now and send your comment and I can, of course, raise it. I want to move on, Sue. So I want can, to ask can I just, you. Can yes. I just add one thing to that? Yes. So we do a lot. We have cadets. We have a lot of cadets on the borough, which is a kind of stepping stone into police. But we use our cadets to go into supermarkets and hardware stores and try and buy a knife. If they can succeed, the trading standards with the local authority will go in and prosecute them. OK, good. Thank you very much. That's a good point. Let's now address the acid attacks. OK. Did you know Tower Hamlets is ranking the third highest acid attack ridden Barra in the country at the moment? Second I one is Waltham in, Forest. In, right. I, I don't know who the London. first one no. is. Newham. Newham's the highest by far. Newham's got... Well, luckily, I don't... More. Luckily, we don't live in Newham, and luckily, we don't yeah. live in, Buck uh, in Buckingham, Buckingham and Dagenham. But it still is happening yeah. in your patch. It is. I'm sorry, under your watch. Not, you're not responsible for it, I know that, but it's happening. And what are you going to do to reassure my viewers that you're going to take decisive action and you're going to you know, move every mountain that there is that needs to be moved to end this horrendous crime called acid attack? Yeah, well, they're vile. They're horrible crimes. I absolutely agree. But let me put the record straight here because people talk about hate crimes. So a We're racial, coming to hate crime in a minute. Yeah, but using acid for a racial crime. Okay. We've had none of those on Tower Hamlets. We've had one incident of domestic abuse where we've had six victims. We've had 28 incidents this year. So it's been quoted we've had triple that amount, but we haven't. We've had 28 incidents this year. But not all the victims. Sorry, oops. But not all the victims have been um, um, injured with the acid. So, so it's it's is more complicated because when you record acid attacks, it could be because someone says I've been threatened. It might be thrown but missed. It might be water, but they believe it to be acid and therefore it's recorded as an acid 
attack. And people need to understand there's corrosive substances and then there's um, a noxious substance like bleach or even CS spray, which has been recorded as um, an acid attack. So we've actually got a lot less than people think, but it's 28 too many incidents, and I give you that. It's too many. And we so, need to stop so that right now. It has people to stop. are fed up. So I, I have initiated with my officers that when they s stop and search people, that they should look at what they're carrying. So if they, if they stop and search someone, or they're talking to someone that's got a bottle, they're quite rightly, they can open the bottle, they can sniff it, they can get them to drink it if it's you know, supposed to be drink. We have arrested two people in recent, in the last week, carrying acid in drinking bottles. No. They have been arrested. Right, and that is and just what would from be the prosecution? What would be the prosecution pending for these people? Right. That's the other question oh, I have. But hold right. on, let me just read a few messages. Okay. Uh, straight away, I have a responses to the suggestion whether they should register the knives. Ridiculous idea uh, about registering when buying a knife. Fair enough. Somebody else wrote, Ajman Masrur, you made a valid point, but I disagree with you. I think it's really difficult to trace every buyer. Um, every household has a knife. How are you going to register everyone and every knife? You know what, listeners, it was a suggestion, viewers. What's, your, what's our problem? In other words, why are you worried about registering? Are you worried that you're going to use or misuse your knife? I don't mind. I'll register every knife that I have, including my garden knife. I have nothing to hide. If it's going to save one life, I think it's worth doing it. So if you disagree with me, it's fine. You're allowed to. But I'm telling, I'm saying to you, my view, there's no... Uh, 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 Sue Williams' view, by the way. I'm saying it should be. We should push for this. Knife should come with a barcode. Barcode should, should be registered against my name and my ID if I buy one. And I should be held responsible if that knife is going missing. Do you know why? Because in my household, if my son takes my knife, if somebody else takes my knife and commits a crime, I want to ask myself, what have I been doing and why have I not been keeping an eye on my children? Where are they going? And that may be a bit too... Um, over the top, as far as some of you are concerned, but it is certainly a concern. We have moved on to acid crime, and acid crime, acid attack, has blighted many of our people, destroyed their future, destroyed their, disfigured their faces, melted their skins, absolute horrendous attacks. It's happened in our streets, in our country, in our city, London, and in particular, Tower Hamlets. And we have Sue Williams, Chief of Police, in Tower Hamlets here, to answer some of those questions. So if you've got a question to ask with um, Acid Attack on Facebook Live, please go to the Channel SS Facebook or you can go to my own Facebook, my name Ajbal Masrur, and you can join in this conversation and ask those questions or raise your comments and I certainly will read them. So Acid Attack is mm -hmm. a major concern. It is. People are questioning that. Um, you are about to tell us about the repercussion or um, what punishment they can expect. Yes, yeah, so um, the CPS, Crown Prosecution Service, they have um, issued guidelines, um, but they always say that every incident has to be judged on its merit, so every offence, every offender has to be judged on uniquely that incident. Um, we bring people to prosecution, we get to speak to the CPS, they allow us to charge someone, we take them before the court. Then it is up to the CPS to put the prosecution case and for the magistrates or Crown Prosecution, uh, sorry, or the Crown Court, if it's a more serious offence, to be able to judge or hold that individual to account, whether it's by jury or otherwise. So we can only take it to a certain point. So what I've done is I have written a community impact statement, which explains the impact that the community feel. Every officer that deals with an acid attack or something related, will put that in their case papers, that will go to the Crown Prosecution Service to read to the magistrate or the judge that here is the community impact signed by the borough commander. So that will help get a better penalty, we hope, and justice for the victim. Well, if you ask me, they should be locked away for a very long time. In fact, they should be penalised so badly that they will never think of doing it again. It melts people's figures, their faces. It disfigures them for forever. It is a horrendous, most cowardly attack. If you have ever, ever been a victim of it, our heartfelt sympathy for you. We want to support you in every way possible. But if you have been an attacker, a, a culprit, a perpetrator, you will be caught. You will not run away from 
your crime, you will be caught. And I would be asking for, and I certainly would be pushing for, our government to take more decisive steps in putting people who commit such horrendous crimes behind bars for a long time, with, without parole as far as I'm concerned. You don't deserve one if you've destroyed someone else's life. Can anyway, I put an appeal I'm, in I've here? Got a, I've got a question to raise to you, but I need to also take a break. So go ahead, put in your appeal. Right. So my appeal is, if you know someone that is carrying acid or a noxious substance, then please tell us. You can ring Crime Fighters anon anonymously, or you can ring 101, or you can tell your local safer neighbourhood officer, but tell the police. Do not let them get away with it, because we know that people will use it. Well, let, here's a question from somebody. Somebody called Koyasmi has just written. Can you please ask the officer uh, that why is it that the safer neighbourhood police always put in other tasks, for example, when I phone the safer neighbourhood team police for local ASB issues, I get told that, sorry, we can't come to check because there is not enough officers. They are all tasked uh, to Brick Lane. What? He said in his uh, exclamation marks about five of them afterward. Mm. The question is, it is true, and I've heard this from many people, that the police are stretched. They mm. can't cope with the demand. And they do say, really sorry, we can't come because we are tasked with other more priority and more important uh, issues. Um, so why should the communities even bother calling you when you're not going to be able to attend when you're so overstretched? OK, so I'll, I'll talk first of all about safer neighbourhoods because we have a, given a commitment to... Um, this is an, an offer that the mayor made, the mayor of Sadiq Khan, um, that every ward will have two dedicated ward officers and one dedicated PCSO. They are on their ward, they are ring-fenced, they will not be used for anything other than activities on their ward. Now, the wards here are very busy, I'll give them that, and we probably need more than two officers per ward, but that is the offer that's currently made by Sadiq Khan. Now, given the amount of terrorist incidents and the awful tragedy of Grenfell Tower and a number of other issues in central London, my officers have to protect not only Tower Hamlets, they have to protect central London as what? well. Because we're part of the Met Police. So but isn't Tower Hamlets priority? You are the boss of, you're chief of Tower Hamlets. Yeah. You're not chief of uh, Met Police, are you? I'm not exactly. I'm you not. will be one day, I'm sure, uh, but today knows? you are who in Tower Hamlets. Uh, absolutely. But the Metropolitan Police Officer is signed up to policing London, not so just So this is the news to me. So a so, Tower Police Officer could be quite easily taken away from Tower Hamlets and he could be serving, I don't know, Lewisham, for all that no, I care, no. while there could be a crime happening in London, no. I mean, in Tower Hamlets. So the, the difference is, when we've had terrorist attacks, then we've had to police um, parts of central London, as the public would expect us to. So for a, a unique period, and this has been unique policing since we've had Westminster, London Bridge, the Manchester, which has created additional um, issues. There was Finsbury Park attack, and then, of course, we had Grenfell Tower, a disaster where they needed... Each borough cannot police it just with their own cops. Okay. We need to bring other cops Hold in. Hold on to that thought. We need to, of course, talk about more of this, and I want to talk about the budget cuts, the impact of it on our local policing. So don't go anywhere... Right now, we're going to take a quick break, but when we do come back, I still have lots of questions about community engagement, about other issues, but importantly, hate crime, Islamophobia, and all sorts of other things that are pressing and bothering you and me, of course. So, be back in a few seconds. Please stay put. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Welcome back. We are here. Talking about policing in the borough, policing in Tower Hamlets in particular, because we are very fortunate, very honoured to have the presence of and the company of uh, Sue Williams. She is Chief Superintendent of the borough. And that is, in simple terms, layman's terms, she is the Chief of Police in Tower Hamlets. Not the entire Metropolitan Police, though she may become one day. That's a different discussion. I want to finish off our conversation to do with the acid attack and move to the next one which I believe it's uh, uh, causing a lot of people a, a lot of discomfort, and that is moped uh, riding yobs, youth, uh, uh, louts, I call them, uh, who are attacking people, robbing people. In fact, I have been a victim of a moped uh, crime 
not that long ago. And guess what police did for me? Zero. Absolutely zero. In fact, I did more investigation than they did. I know I'm saying it on a live TV program, but that is the truth. So we're going to quickly go to wrap up the programs that we talked about when it came to acid attack. And I know um, Sue wanted to talk about how you actually don't desert a barra. Uh, there is a minimum yeah. strength that you leave behind. So absolutely, and I need to clarify that. Um, so we have all our teams, the emergency response teams, have a minimum strength. We never go below that minimum strength because that is what we need to police the borough. So I don't want to give the impression that all my officers are off policing somewhere else. We still have a full CID, we have safer neighbourhoods, um, and we have our partnership officers and our schools team um, who are all there in force policing the borough. So... Please, people, be rest assured. We do have enough police officers, but we would love more. Of I think people are people more. are questioning you or disagreeing with you in vehement manner. So yeah. uh, somebody just wrote, "I'm sorry, that's a that's a load of lie about H, uh, th officers, timeless officers, um, manning other boroughs." Yes, I can understand if it is a major emergency such as terrorism, but every borough has set amount of officers covering each borough in London, which you've just talked about, yeah, the minimum. Absolutely. So our safer neighbourhood team are manning the drunken people around Brick Lane whilst other streets are unmanned without any officers. And that makes it easy for criminals uh, with their easy activities. So, of course, this person disagrees. Drug dealers yeah. are products of society, a never-ending cycle of supply and demand. Family members are happy. Their sons are bringing a lot of money. And another call, another message has come through. It's not my community. It's, uh, uh, brought, it's brought problems. We need to go deep, uh, get the dealers out from our society. Uh, they're talking about drugs, of course. I wanted to touch on drugs in a minute. So uh, let's see if we can address both of these issues. Drugs, okay. the drug dealing that happens in Tower Hamlets. Everywhere you go, you can smell skunk. Mm. You can smell cannabis. You can see people are selling them. And not much is being done as far as the local people are concerned. They want you to do something more. And what can you do? And of course, how can you stop? Young people not wearing helmet, getting on moped and robbing people in the daylight and not being chased and not being taken down by the police officers is also creating a lot of fear amongst our community. What are you going to do about that? OK, so let me talk about antisocial behaviour and drugs. So when I came to the borough, I put antisocial behaviour as one of my priorities. It is still a priority. What underpins antisocial behaviour is drug abuse and drug misuse. So we are doing something. So I'm working with our partners at the local authority. We um, we had some people come in who did some work around antisocial behavior. We now have a blueprint for the borough. We have recommendations of how we will work together. So it's not just about police. Police are there to enforce, but we also need people there as preventative or to pick up where people have drugs habits or alcohol um, habits or if they've got mental health issues. So we need to work as a partnership to solve this. But let me, let me ask you, a, do, let me stop you and ask you something simple. Do you think our society has failed? British society has failed in dealing with this endemic drugs problem that we have in our society. Just for our record, I'm not saying you have failed. I'm talking about the overall ethos in the way we deal with drugs. We've had conversations by pol politicians want to decriminalize some aspects mm -hmm. of drugs. Um, all of these are sending the wrong message as far as we're concerned. It's making drugs and selling of drugs more fashionable. It brings in quick money. It gives you a buzz. It enables young people to feel merry about themselves. Why not use it? This, to me, is the root of the problem. I don't think the problem is... Uh, how many people do you arrest? The attitude has changed towards drugs. Very soon, you probably won't even be th arresting anyone for selling drugs. I think it's a really tricky situation because you've got people on all sides with different views about how you deal with drugs. Tower Hamlets, unfortunately, for years, has always been a borough that has had a drug problem. Um, and that will go back 30 years. So I know people that have worked on this borough 30 years ago and they said it was always seen as the place to come and get your cheap drugs. Now, I see drugs as being a root cause of what we call antisocial behaviour. So it's important to me to get a, a strategy 
working with partnership on how we're going to tackle antisocial behaviour, street crime, and that includes drug misuse. And you're absolutely right. It's a horrible crime out there because it does affect young people. Um, it ruins life if you become a drug user. Um, and it creates all sorts of nasty relationships with neighbours where you've got people smoking drugs outside in the garden or in next door flats. My Safer Neighbourhood teams have been problem solving. They have done loads of warrants on flats. They've arrested a lot of people. We are always consistently the highest borough for proceeds of crime. We get a portion of the money that we seize of drug dealers and Tower Hamlets get a proportion of that money ploughed back into policing on our borough. That enables me to give officers overtime to create initiatives and to do things in partnership to try to prevent drug abuse on but the borough. But that money actually is the hard-earned money of somebody else somewhere else who has gone and bought the drugs from the dealers and that dealer then has then made lots of crime. Yeah, I understand, but they are making money out of it. Yeah. Whether the police officers or the Metropolitan Police or entire government benefits from the proceeds of crime, that in itself is a moral problem, an ethical discussion we must have. One of our viewers have just written saying it's the problem is to do with our moral degradation of our society. Mm. Morality plays no role. So there are drugs okay. It's fashionable. It's been drunk it's been taken by everybody. I but can't that's wrong. It's wrong, isn't it? Okay. So you have people, celebrities, who will quite openly smoke drugs or inject or whatever. They think it's very fashionable. But it is wrong. And um, actually, we have to change the culture, and it starts with young people. So you tell young people it's not right to do drugs. But when you've got a young kid, 16 years old, that sees a gang member, and they say, here, you could earn £200 a, a day just de dealing drugs, it's very, it, it's very easy for young people to fall into that so, trap. So do you think economic deprivation also plays it, yeah. it does okay so what can we do i mean okay, let me ask these viewers what do you think we should do to drug dealers let me see an honest response mm. uh, i would be funny to read some of those I'm, I'm, some of those i'm pretty certain i'm not even sure if i can read them all but what do you think we should do to drug dealers drug abusers need rehabilitation as soon as possible we need to put them to a me through a medical program i've seen too many young lives being completely lost and wasted because of drugs abuse but what do we do to dealers? How should we punish our dealers? And has our country lost its moral compass when it comes to drugs and attitude to drugs? And has our legal system become bankrupt at the hands of the drug barons and drug dealers because they can get away with it and our legal system doesn't provide enough punitive punishment? Is that the problem? What do you think and what should be the solution? Give us um, a message on our Facebook Live right now, Channel S's Facebook or my own Ajmal Masroor um, or Channel S. You'll find both of our Facebook Live right now buzzing with the conversation or you can email us. The email address is on the screen as you can see and I'll read some of your solutions. What should we do to drug dealers? What should we do to drug dealers? Okay, so uh, whatever, whatever with drug dealers is one thing. But um, there is something the community can do. So MOPAC, um, the Met Police, drugs is not a priority. There are lots of priorities. Safeguarding, quite rightly, young people is a priority. And we have other priorities. But drugs has not been a priority. Um, so I think if people feel in their own location that drugs is a priority, they need to be telling their safer neighbourhood ward panels because if they tell their ward panels, they will show it as a priority and they will ask the safer neighbourhood officers to go out and do work around drugs. But sometimes they say driving over 20 miles an hour is a priority. So whatever the priorities are is what the safer neighbourhood officers will respond to. If the borough as a whole, through their safer neighbourhood ward panels, say to the safer neighbourhood board, drugs is a priority, then that allows me to have a conversation with MOPAC that actually drugs is a priority for my borough and I want it as a priority where I can not be judged on the robbery, the burglary or the other areas of crime, but I can be judged on how I deal with drugs. At the moment, that's not the case. I have two, uh, two messages here. I say zero tolerance towards uh, drug dealers and make examples out of um, our children's future are at stake and somebody else said my head is 
too big to bury in the sand. I know all the dealers are British Bangladeshis. Even if they come from our prison, they still go back to deal. I think the local council and government can play a big role here. When you say Bangladesh is exclusively, that may be in, in, inaccurate. Mm. Drug dealers come from all background. And if they do come from Bangladeshi background, and if you happen to watch this program, I'll also blame the parents. Where on earth are the parents? What are the parents doing to prevent their children from falling into that trap, into that absolute cycle of disgusting, uh, degrading, inhuman activities called drug dealing? What are the parents doing? Government and the police officers can only do so much. If you know your son or your daughter is selling drugs, have you reported them yet? Or are you sitting silently at home thinking, ah, it's my little boy, he's earning a bit of money, he's doing no harm. Well, he is causing a destruction in our society. So blaming the government and blaming the police officers isn't going to solve the problem. The community needs to do something. Parents need to take decisive action first. That's my response to that particular uh, message. But what do you do to drugs and drug dealers is another discussion that we must park on the side and move on. Let me ask uh, Sue a couple of other questions to do with a rise in Islamophobic attack. Mm. There has been a, a rise of 59%. Yeah, hi. 86 reported incidents. While there were 122 reported homophobic incidents, a rise of 39%. Islamophobic attack has risen to 59%. That means if you are a Muslim, if you look like a Muslim, if you are a lady and wear a hijab and you appear like a Muslim, if you have a name that sounds like a Muslim, and if your skin color is Asian or brown looking, you're more likely to be targeted, not just by your race, but by your faith. It's a double attack. Mm. Now, uh, Sue, please tell us and reassure us, what are you going to do or what are you doing to completely root out all hate crimes, especially Islamophobic attack from Tower Hamlets? OK, and I think that's a really good point. And there have been reasons why hate crime has gone up. So we know last year when he had the Paris attacks and there were, um, att there were um, attacks on Muslim people in this country, as well as Jewish people, um, so anti-Semitism um, incidents went up as well. This year, when we've had, as mentioned, the Westminster, London Bridge, Manchester and the Finsbury Park, there has been a backlash on our Muslim communities. Now, what I've said to the Muslim community, I know it's gone up, but please report every incident because I have the power to put resources where I see a pattern or trend emerging. If you don't tell me that something's happened, then I can't put the resources in the right place. So if a community come to me and say, on Whitechapel Road, there is a person dressed like this, who looks like this, who's going around making comments about Muslim people. If they tell me about it, then I can put somebody out there and hopefully we'll put a camera through, because we've got a very good CCTV network, or I get officers in the location and we'll identify the person and arrest them. You know, now, talking about CCTV, you've just j uh, jigged my memory a bit. CCTV seems to work when it comes to parking tickets. The no, same, that's a local authority uh, issue. The same, same CCTV doesn't work when it comes to a crime. Oh, I, th I think it does. We have an excellent relationship um, with the CCTV room. They have so a why direct is it that when, they, Why no, is it that when my car link. was broken into <laughs> by robbers on a moped, I, op I went and obtained them. The police didn't. Yeah. I reported it. I s begged them. I chased them. They did nothing. I went to the store and I spoke to the security of the store and they gave me the copy, which I then emailed to the police officers. And even then they did nothing. Okay. Why? I can't answer about your particular incident. I don't know about it, but I'm talking about local authority CCTV cameras. If something is happening or we think something's about to happen, we can have police officers talking to the control room. The control room are really good how they work. They've got a, a, a radio link directly with us and we can ask them to look at a particular individual. And if we think they're causing a hate crime, we can go in and arrest them. And what I wanted to say about some of the other hate crimes, we have got officers, I have invested in officers doing hate crime work. So I've had an officer doing LGBT, working with the um, lesbian, gay, um, uh, like homosexual type um, 
uh, homophobic crime and that has increased the crime because they have been out there with the community getting them to report. We've worked with the disabled community, we've briefed all our officers on disability crime so that they know it is a crime and that has increased but that I see as a good thing in these crimes because we're getting more awareness of police officers and more awareness in the community to report. Um, and. Um, I was going to say there Islamophobia was... is particularly a problem that we have been well, seeing. It, it is for Tower Hamlets, absolutely. But across the country, it's not just Tower yeah. Hamlets. <clears throat> in Tower Hamlets, you have a large number of visible Muslim presence. A yeah. lot of ladies go out there wearing hijab, yeah. and a lot of men wear their Islamic dress, as they call it, or traditional mm. dress. They are very, very vulnerable to attack. Verbal abuse is on the high. Uh, all sorts of remarks are made. I see it often that people are looking at me with a very different set of eyes than they did a few years ago. What are you doing as police officers at local level, mm. firstly to reassure the community and secondly to actually tackle this issue, the rise in Islamophobic crime? Okay, so first of all, I've created a post for a faith officer to go out and work with the communities and all the different faith. Um, he has been going into the mosque, he's been talking to people in there about making sure they report hate crime, that they understand what a hate crime is, and reassuring the public so that they do feel safe out there. Because it's not I, a I find it very borough. odd that you have a faith officer who is going out there to uh, talk to all faiths, when the is, uh, crime is Islamophobic crime, there should be an officer dealing with the Muslim community directly about Islamophobia. Just like you have for the LGBT community, a specific officer allocated to that community, why don't you have an officer dealing with any Islamophobic attack directly and going out to the Muslim communities, reassuring them and meeting them and getting the reported crime to also increase? So that wouldn't really be fair to other faiths. No, but other, but, the Islamophobic but, attack is not no. other faith. Okay, so let me just say, our hate crime officer deals with disability, homophobic hate crime, race and faith hate crime. He deals with the lot, so it's not just working one, with one You just said that you have got a specific officer who deals with no, he's, LGBT he's a, communities. He is a liaison officer that works with the LGBT community, but he's actually my hate faith officer. So one That's person doing all of that. There's, there's a couple of officers okay. there. But I'm but, requesting. But my faith officer, mm -hmm. right, does do a lot of the mosques because we have so many mosques on the borough. Okay. But equally, we have anti-Semitic crime. It's only right and proper that he works with the Jewish community and the synagogues that also experience I, hate I, crime. I entirely so agree with you, it, but how many synagogues he, do you have in the borough? Hold on, hold oh, on. Oh, few. Yeah. No, hold on, hold on a second. Let's put it into perspective. There are 56 to 59 mosques in the borough. Yeah. As opposed to maybe two, two synagogues in this borough. Three, I think. Two or three, whatever it is. Number is very small. I'm not saying we should not protect. Of course we should protect them. Mm. We will do everything possible to protect every community. But there has been a 59% attack, mm. increase attack on the Muslim community. And you have not yet given me any reassurance that you have actually a, a, a thought of allocating an officer dedicated to dealing with Islamophobic attack. That is very worrying. But our community safety unit do deal with specifically all types of hate crime. So they will pick up the Islamophobic attacks. But because I put a, a faith officer who clearly will go to more mosques than temples or synagogues because we have more mosques, he is in those mosques at prayer time. He's there on a Friday. He's there at other key points of time. Um, he's, um, he works very closely with all the different mosques out there on the borough um, to get people to report and to tell him about what's happening. So it's almost a dedicated role, but it has to be all faiths on the borough. We also work with the, um, the, um, the faith forum. So we have a very good faith forum on the borough, and that is a faith forum uh, that represents all the faiths across the borough. But we work with them around third party reporting um, and providing some reassurance to the different communities. Um, so we do work with the Muslim community because we know it's an issue. Okay. And I'm not saying it isn't. And we will work to take every crime that is reported as a Islamophobic crime. You can guarantee that we will take seriously and we will deal with it to our best of our ability to bring that offender to justice. I'll be I'll be held accountable if I didn't ask you a question about terrorism as well as stop and search. All oh, right, okay. So terrorism 
has become the buzzword for everybody. Everything mm. is terror related. Um, I'm not belittling the threat. I'm not saying it's not there. But some communities do feel that this has come at the expense of all the other local social antisocial behavior issues, crimes that we are facing every day. And terrorism has become almost, if you can eradicate terrorism from the world, it's become the panacea for all problems. Communities are very frustrated by this um, e exaggerated emphasis on terrorism. Whereas local policing, community policing is missing. Mm. Um, what are you doing to strike a balance between the two? So I have my priorities for local policing. So that's around safeguarding. And some of terrorism is about safeguarding young people who have got mental health or who are being courted over the Internet and they're being checked, their ideology is being challenged. So we do look to safeguard people. So that's a priority for me. Um, my other priority is around violence with injury. So when people get very badly assaulted, I want to give the victim the best possible service. And my third priority is around antisocial behaviour, because as we said before, that covers things like street crime and drugs. So for me, that is a priority. For the London and for the Mayor of London and for the Metropolitan Police, terrorism is also a priority, which means that my officers also have to bear in mind things that may be construed as terrorist acts um, and challenging people because if you look at but what people know? hold dear about no but if you look at what people want out of policing one of their top priorities is about being safe from a terrorist attack that is really important isn't that because media constantly plays the threat of terrorism continuously and and yet the truth is you're more likely to die because you've been knocked down by a car than a terror threat okay you're more likely to die of those everyday incidents than a terror threat in our country across the globe so your media yes. is it uh, we don't. Do you, do you put no, it on that? we don't talk. We don't exaggerate terror threats in our country. Yeah. Some media in this so, country do, hold and on. we so know who they are. Do you think Westminster and London Bridge has been uh, exaggerated? No, no, no. Th of course, they're real threats. I, I'm living with two death threats for your record, and I know what ter terror attack means. Mm. I'm saying people are facing acid attack on, on their streets. Yeah. People are seeing on their doorstep prostitution, drug dealing, knife crime, antisocial behavior. And they're being told by the police officers, sorry, all our officers have gone to deal with terror threat, threat somewhere else. We can't deal with these local issues. Obviously, local people are frustrated. They're thinking the focus has, has shifted. If we can put our house in order, surely the world will come to an order. Okay, so can't answer all of that, but what I will say is, so in terms of local policing, we've been working with the, the mayor of Tower, Tower Hamlets, and uh, we're trying to increase our number of funded officers who are dedicated to working on parts of Tower Hamlets. And we've agreed at the moment for 14 funded officers. There will always be opportunity for more funded officers, and we will work towards that, because if we have a partnership with the local authority, we do the enforcement, they come in and they do the partnership work and the voluntary sector come behind and do the work with the vulnerable people that are causing some of the issues. That allows my officers to concentrate on priorities and it allows us to also consider threats around terrorism if we have to. Do you have any plans to, as a police officer, as, poli as the chief of Barra itself, do you have any plans to tackle terrorism head on here? In Tower Hamlets? In Tower Hamlets. So, we have um, a counter-terrorism patrols, um, so we have some very iconic sites on the borough. Um, so that's like Tower of London, we have Brick Lane, which is why your caller will often see uh, cops down there, yeah. because it's an iconic area. Not because Crowd there are too many drunken people no, there. No, it's a crowded place. So where there are crowded places, we will put officers. East London Mosque, we have patrols that are operate around there. Um, we have other iconic sites on the borough where we have our counter-terrorism patrols will patrol. We have quite a big team. We have, of course, we've got Canary Wharf, which has been already been an, a, a, um, a, a target for a terrorist attack. So we have patrols around there. Um, and we also have um, like the, the, the big ships that come in and out of Canary Wharf, and we have to protect them. But as well, we have a lot of VIP, very important people that visit the borough, royalty, politicians or otherwise. And part of our protection plans is around considering could they be a target 
for terrorism. And we have to look at that as well. Uh, to finish off our program, we have run out of time really, but it's been brilliant so far. Let me ask you one simple question. Uh, we have talked about a lot of things. You've talked about your plans, you've talked about your work. You haven't yet talked about community policing. Has it gone off your radar? Has it gone off the agenda of the police? Community policing, things that worked with partnership at local level from the grassroots. The communities trust the police officers. Police officers have a relationship with the communities. Communities become a friend rather than a foe. Mm. Communities work in partnership like we did long time ago. Are we going to see a return of this now that you are the chief of Tower Hamlets? Well, I would hope so because partnership working with the communities is really dear, close to my heart it's really important for all the reasons you've said we need to work closely together otherwise we will never solve any issues around crime my safer neighborhood officers and i've got some brilliant officers there problem solve a lot of those issues at the root cause at the bottom at street level so we will work quite closely of that but community engagement and i've been criticized for not doing enough and i have I have made myself available to visit ward panels. I've had, um, oh, sorry, to have the ward chairs come and see me. My officers will go to ward panels. We've had safer neighbourhood question and answer sessions. We've had um, a number of safer neighbourhood meetings where community can come to. I've even had a police academy which has showcased things we've been doing around policing like carrying taser, stop and search antisocial behaviour, just so that the community understand what it is we do about policing. I, there's more I can do. Indeed. I get that. Indeed. And I will c carry on doing as much as I can to engage with the community. Thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Sue Williams. I have an uh, interesting message that I'll read with which I'll finish. Uh, somebody says, um, Muslims, take control of your own affairs. Um, interesting. Somebody else wrote, Muslims are British. It's not only Muslim community problems, so why not leave a Muslim state if the government want us to take our responsibility? Well, you know what? It is not true that it is a Muslim problem. It is not true that this is an us and them problem. It's all of our problem. We're in it together. We need to keep our homes safe. We need to keep our community safe. And we need to take and play a responsible part in it as parents, as community leaders, as people, not just rely on the police officers. Of course, we should support them and become part and parcel of that friendship, that partnership, that community of policing, as well as communities together. Stay safe. My thanks to Sue Williams for her time. And thanks to you all for taking part. Until next time, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.